Well, it is awesome to have Ryan Burge back talking about the particular denomination. If you didn't listen to the first episode, you need to go listen to it because um, we, we talked more generally. But we're going to take a deep dive into the Southern Baptist Convention, which is always a fascinating thing to do. Uh, the annual meeting's coming up here soon. Uh, so uh, I, I realize that this is on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. And if you aren't part of this tribe, hey, you should still tune in because there's a lot of lessons to, to learn here. Um, so we're seeing some pretty rapid declines in the Southern Baptist Convention on a scope and scale that really is unprecedented in American history. And we're going to dive into that here in just a moment. But I certainly want to thank our sponsor, Tithely. Tithely has been very gracious to, to sponsor all of these Burge reports because uh, they are research based. And uh, we've got Ryan Burge to tell us what the facts are. And Tithely is sponsoring it so that we can be able to do that. So 40,000 churches use Tithely for online giving, text giving, management of all sorts of church software systems. Um, they are really good at what they do. And they are offering you a free report called the 2023 State of, the State of Church Giving Report. It's fascinating. Lots of good information in there. So there is a link in the show notes for you to click to go get that. Again, it's free, so you might as well go check it out uh, and learn more about what is going on in the church giving world. Ryan, your name's in the title of the episode. Welcome back to your own show. Thank you so much, Sam and Tom. The Burge Report, Man. number two. I, when we get to number nine, can I do the Beatles number nine song? Tom, number you're nine. dating yourself so much right number now. Nine. I never watch cool. <laughs> well, nothing changed, buddy. Keep it up. <laughs> All right. Let's go on this path. Sam, you have done your own research on this. So you've been watching it. Uh, I sent a warning shot many years ago about what was about to happen. I think about 10 people read it and listened to it. So let's, let's, let's begin to talk about the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, I don't I, I'm not going to say I'm going to be quiet, but I'm going to love listening to you and Ryan have a conversation about this. Well, Dad, you were the first. I will give you credit. 2005, a conservative resurgence not yet realized. Um, you can pretty much take the yet out now. We're so many years <laughs> removed, and, and it's not going to happen. Um, and yeah, we're in a state of severe decline. And I say we simply because I'm still technically part of this tribe. Um, I know Ryan is not, um, but Ryan Grew up that way. He grew up Southern Baptist, everybody. Full disclosure, SBC. Everybody grew up Southern Baptist. <laughs> and it's a – so, well, Ryan, why is the Southern Baptist Convention still important? Why are we even talking about it? Oh, because it's still easily the largest denomination in America. I mean, the thing is, like, it has declined. I think that's that's a, that's a statistical fact. But it the eyes of the world, the religion reporters of the world, will descend on Indianapolis – for the annual meeting in June, because it is the largest meeting of any denomination in history. Guys, back in the 70s, they had these meetings, 45,000 people showed up. Think about that, 45,000 people. I now, at a there. typical meeting, now 10 or 12,000. You were there, Tom? I was there for the, actually, I was there for 82 and 84 and 85, which were some of the big ones. Huge. I mean, the thing is, like, if you want to see, like, I think a lot of reporters think, well, the, as so the Southern Baptists go, so do evangelicalism. And obviously evangelicalism plays this outsized role in American society, American culture, American politics. And so kind of watching what the SBC does is indicative of, like, everything downstream of that, of what's going on in evangelicalism. The other thing is, how, if non-denoms are growing so fast, and they are, how do you cover them from a, from a re reporter standpoint? They don't have meetings. You know, there's never a time where 10,000 non-denom leaders join together in a place and vote on stuff. So in that way, the SBC is sort of one of one in how big it is, still how important it is. Even though it's sort of a lumbering dinosaur, I think, and like archaic from a different era, it still is the only option that a lot of religion reporters have to covering what's going on in evangelicalism. So, Ryan, tell us what's going on with the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, I, is it is it unraveling? Is it really as bad as some people say it is? Uh, is bad. Um, I think that people, especially younger, I was born in 82, so I don't have like a long understanding of the history of the SBC, but if you look at their membership numbers, they were adding a million people every four to five years for decades in the post-war period. 
I mean, that's staggering to think about just numerically. Like every year we show up to the convention and we've added 250,000 people. That's 5,000 new converts every week for wow. decades to the SBC. Like it was just exploding. And man, it's fun to build institutions when you've got 250,000 more givers every single year added to the roles, right? And I think for a lot of times they kind of got, you know, they got real high on their own supply, as you say, right? Like we're going to have more money. We can build more institutions, send out more missionaries. And if you look at it, it's almost like a roller coaster. You know, you, you hit that lift at the beginning and the chain starts click, 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 and you go up and up and up and you get to the top and you sort of like slowly crest the hill. And then you sit at the top of the hill and just sit there for a second and go, oh no, this is not going to be good. And that was 2006, by the way. That's when the hit when you hit the peak of the hill, 16.2 million members of the SBC, the largest Protestant nomination we've ever had and probably will ever have, by the way, at least in the next hundred years. And then from that point, it started going slowly down, slowly down, slowly down. And the last three years have been absolutely catastrophic. The SBC has lost 1.3 million members in just the last three years alone. To put some numbers on that, the Presbyterian Church USA has a total membership of 1.1 million members. The SBC lost 1.3 million in just the last three years. So, and, and by the way, I've heard people say, oh, it's just we're cleaning up our, our roles. They're not because the, the share who are weekly attenders has continued to decline in the SBC over the last 10 years, which would not happen if you were taking off the inactives. The weekly attendance rate would actually go up a little bit because your denominator would get smaller. So the, that whole narrative, I don't buy a little bit. The SBC is going to continue to decline. I mean, it might be below 10 million members in, in 20 years, which would be a staggering decline from a denomination that was 16 million not too long ago. You know, it's so one of it, the things it, that... Is it 2006 causation or correlation? The reason I ask... I think is, it's... Yeah. The, the reason I ask, in 2006, Tom Rainer became the CEO of the largest Southern Baptist Convention entity. So, You're the reason, Dad. So I came in and I precipitated the decline. Is that causation or is that correlation? Uh, I will say this time, I think Lifeway is a cool kind of like way to um, really see what the declines meant like, though, right? Because it was, you guys did own this huge building in downtown Nashville, sold it to a developer, built a new building, then moved into one floor of that building, and then sold out that floor entirely. And almost I mean, obviously that, that, that's happened. Almost not exactly. You're close. You're close. But I, sold, but I mean, I, it show, I, I sold the building. Yes. Moved yeah. into a new building, went from 1.6 million square feet to 257,000 square feet. We filled mm -hmm. up most of the building to begin with. Then what but, happened? Now? Yes. Yeah. Then you stop. It, one floor went to one floor. Now it's, it, they don't even own it anymore, right? That is correct. They have sold the building and they have a lease office uh, in a suburb right now. See, to me, that is like epitomizes what the SPC is going to have to do at a much larger scale over the next 30 or 40 years. You cannot support the infrastructure of the SBC when you're – and by the way, the cooperative program, it used to be the average church gave about 10% of their money to the cooperative program, went to the, you know, went to the state conventions. They went up to co – I don't want to get into the details of all that works. But now the percentage is closer to 4%. So the money's going down as the attendance is going down, as the membership is going down. And man, it is hard to, to decline as an organization. You know, who do you fire? What building do you sell? What program do you stop? The, you know, bad news precipitates bad news. And it's really hard to spin out of a negative PR cycle. And boy, the SBC is in a very bad. And add to that, obviously, this sex abuse scandal and the DOJ investigation on top of all those things. I just don't think – I don't see how the SBC turns the narrative around, in the near term at least. Wow. Fewer people giving fewer dollars, mm -hmm. less evangelism, more scandals, and more eyeballs because of abuse it is just an absolute recipe for disaster. Meanwhile, we're trying to fund a structure that was built for twice as many people you know, six seminaries and very large uh, uh, mission organizations. And, and by the way, <laughs> you talk about what gets cut. Well, if you're in leadership in the SBC, not my program, not my institution, not my agency, uh, you, you, and that's what's creating even more infighting because people are grasping for, the leaders are grasping for fewer and fewer dollars. Well, look what well, happened yesterday, Sam. Did you see the headline yesterday? They want well, to set up a sex abuse task force. 
Yeah, it'll be it'll be a couple months and down the line. But they want to set up a sex abuse task force. They go to the North American Mission Board and say, "Can we have some money for it?" You know what they say? No, no. The, both the so, International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board said, "Yeah, no, we're not." They both said no. Yeah. Because you know what? They're holding on to every dollar they have knowing that next year their budget's going to get cut because cooperative program dollars are going to go away. So now it's circle the wagons, right? It's become little fiefdoms. It's turf wars now. And I, I just think like the cooperative program has the word in it, cooperative, and they're not cooperating anymore, right? That's what happens when things decline is you start circular firing squads, right? It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. We're going to keep our resources. You guys can deal with it on your own. And and you know what the headline is? No one wants to fund the sex abuse task force for the SBC. Boy, that's really going to get a lot of people in the doors of the local Southern Baptist Church. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We're not funding reform. We're not funding something that will protect your children. That's, that's exactly. the headline. Right or wrong, and we can get into the weeds of like what the SBC did and all that stuff. I'm not interested in that conversation, but perception is reality in this situation. And when people think about the SBC, they're thinking about they covered up abuse. Whether they did or not, it does not matter. The narrative is already out there now, and they're not doing anything, by the way, to change that narrative by how they've been behaving the last six months. So let's change gears a little bit and talk baptisms. So you talked yeah. membership, but when you look at baptisms, baptisms peaked for the Southern Baptist Convention. And by baptisms, it's a close proxy to evangelism because in the Southern Baptist tribe, uh, mm -hmm. you it's a believer's baptism. Baptism You baptize after somebody professes faith. I know in the Presbyterian tradition, Christian Reformed Church, that, you know, there's a different view of baptism. So when I talk baptisms here, I'm just talking about that outward focus, the fact that we're bringing new people in, we're seeing them converted, come to Christ, and assimilated into our church. So that's that's kind of what we mean by baptisms. Baptisms peaked in 1972 with fewer members. Just, mm -hmm. just note that. Baptisms peaked in 1972 with fewer people. They have declined by roughly 60% from 445,000 in 1972 to right around, in last numbers we have at the time of this recording is 2022, 180,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a decline by over half. And what's odd to me is when you look at a chart of baptisms, when did they really just tank? It was right after the conservatives finished taking over the denomination. Now, I can't quite figure out <laughs> exactly why this is. You know, somebody said, okay, why? But what we do know is that what was called the conservative resurgence, or if you're on the other side, the fundamentalist takeover, the conservative resurgence didn't work. It, oh, it did not work. No, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. And that's the thing is what, and we're seeing this again, by the way, if you actually follow the SBC debate a little bit, like closely, the declines are happening. And you know what the answer for some people is? We're not conservative enough. Like that's, they want to purify the denomination even further. And look what they've lost in the last year. They've lost Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. Rick Warren is one of the most famous preachers on earth. And then, you know what happened? And this wasn't reported on very much, but I think it's an even more important story. Stephen Furtick's Elevation Church in North Carolina quietly left the SBC the week after the annual meeting. It was just a letter that said, we are no longer affiliating. We don't want to talk about it. And they've never spoken about it on the record from that point forward because they have women pastors on their staff and they, wanted to, they just didn't want to have that fight that, that Rick Warren had. Those are two of the most vibrant churches in the convention have left. Mm -hmm. So, and they're both going to be non-denom now, by the way, which, which, you know, that's the bigger movement away from denominations to non-denominational churches. I just don't see how the answer is we got to become more conservative when the churches that are growing are not that conservative. Well, and again, we're not making a qualitative statement on theology here. We're making no. statistical statements on reality. So you may be of the view that, well, you know what? More conservative is better, and that's your theological conviction. Fair enough. That's fine. But what it means is more and more declines are coming, and which seminary are we going to close? Or which three seminaries are we going to close um, because of all these declines? So Can I, you may here's want a little to adjacent. purify the, deno the so denomination, but it's going to be smaller by definition. Yeah. Absolutely. But here's the thing, Sam. You know what the seminaries and SBC are doing right now? Creating the next generation of non-denominational pastors? That's what they're cranking out right now. The SBC is subsidizing their own decline, and they don't even see it. They're not recognizing that a lot of those pastors will get an SBC degree 
maybe start the SBC for a while, right? And then two years down the line, they're going to start, you know, the bridge church or the journey church using the same theology in the, in the same classes they took in the SBC seminary. But you know what the journey church is going to do fun functionally on the ground is pull people away from the SBC when the SBC actually subsidized their tuition when they went to an SBC seminary. So it's like, it's like they're, they're sowing the seeds of their own decline right now. If you look at, I, did, I wrote a post about the cost of seminary education. The SBC has actually grown, grown slower in tuition costs than other denominations. It's because they subsidize it so heavily. But now you're subsidizing people leaving and actually drawing people away from your flock. So that's an even worse indicator, I think, of, of what the future looks like for the SBC. Wow. Dad, you, you've made the point about demographics and how the SBC became dependent upon its own constituency um, to increase its population size. But then the opposite took place. Walk me, walk me through that. You, you're talking about the age demographics? Or are you talking? Well, more cultural Christianity. Oh, well, the, the, the SBC, when, when you look at their peak number of 16 million that's a that's a very inflated number by any measurement. The, the sixteen million probably had six seven million cultural Christians. In my definition of a cultural Christian is someone who claims the title of Christianity but is not a true believer. So so we, we could call, we could call them the unconverted. We could we we could say there are a lot of different labels there. So what happened in the SBC was the numbers became inflated with a lot of cultural Christians and the cultural Christianity has waned. It's a very simple statement. You don't have to put on the label of Christian to be accepted in culture, business, politics today. It is not necessary. And if anything happened, the pandemic COVID that exacerbated that trend because people went home and said, I don't have to be a Christian anymore. I don't have to go to church anymore. And cultural Christianity started fading away and they're no longer in the SBC or they're fading away from the SBC. Is that where you're going with that? Sam? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to add about demographics with the SBC? Oh, the SBC has gotten older. Actually, it's gotten old. You know, America's aged. That's what we just know that's happening, the graying of America, but the SBC has actually aged more rapidly. The average evangelical now in America is around 60 years old. Like we've got to think about like in 20 years, the people who are running American religion, a lot of them are going to be dead or, you know, in a place where they can't physically do it anymore. Thank you. So what's the next generation look like? You know, like m m older millennials are going to be the ones who have to take the baton from the boomers. I don't think there's a ton of, I mean, can you name me five really up and coming millennial Southern Baptists who could take over the torch? No one wants to run the executive committee right now, guys. Like, no, that job is awful. I would never do that job. So the problem is, like, we we tore all this up. You got a heaping pile of rubble. The money's going away. Institutions are declining. Memberships are declining. Here, run the largest denomination in American history. Good luck. You know, like, who wants that? No one wants that. They would rather go start a new church down the road and build it from zero to 500. That's exciting and that's interesting. So I just don't see how the SBC recovers from this in any meaningful way. The future certainly looks bleak. Um, and I will say from a statistical standpoint, it looks like more of the same. Like I don't see this turning. There, there is no... There is no work being made that would cause an inflection point from a statistical from a statistical view. Um, what what would change? You know, so th there's nothing that we see changing. So you're just going to get more of the same. And I would I, I've used the analogy of the SBC kind of like a slowly deflating balloon, and every controversy acts as another pinhole, and it just then it just deflates a little more quickly. It's so big that it's not going to disappear overnight. You know, it, that's it's not it's still going to be here in fifty years, but it is highly unlikely that we ever return to the heyday. I don't know if you have a different view on that, Ryan. Oh, I I, I think we'll we'll never see the heyday of any denomination. In America, like the the denominational institutional denominations are over with. Think about the United Methodist lost seventy seven hundred churches and twenty five percent of their members in just the last eighteen months or so. So, and they were the second largest denomination in America. 
And now they've mm-hmm. lost two or three million people. And that the, the long tail of that's going to lose two or three million more from all the, the fallout from all those decisions, right? So like we have seen the future of America is Christian, Protestant Christianity is so much more fragmented and anti-institutional than it's been in, in our, the history of our country. And I don't think we have understood what that means for us, you know, in terms of just institutions and communication and everything else. And I think for the SBC, I think the question is how – how do you die well, right? How do you decline in a meaningful way where you're still doing good work, but fighting. in a much smaller scale? <laughs> we're going to die we're fighting. Gonna fight. Exactly right. We're <laughs> going to fight all the way to the end. And I think that's the most unfortunate thing is there's – to me, there's two things that happen when it, when an institution declines. And I've been around a lot of these in the last couple of years. One is fight like crazy which is what the SBC is doing right now. You don't see that in the main line, by the way. They're not fighting with one another on that side, hardly at all. The United Methodists are an outlier. Presbyterians aren't doing that. You know what they're doing, though? They're denying the statistical reality. They're lo- they're not looking at the trend lines in a real way. And I tell them all the time, I go, listen, an emergency amputation is the worst possible outcome. Strategic precision surgery along the way is so much better than just lopping off a limb because the budget doesn't balance. So think about attrition, right? Don't hire people back for replacements. Think about ways to make institutions or organizations smaller slowly over time. That's the way you've got to think about these institutions going forward because otherwise you're going to get to the point SBC is like, oh, we got a 50 million budget shortfall. Let's stop all international ministries. You know, like what are you going to do? Uh, you can't do it that way. So I think whoever leads the SBC going forward has, has to do yeoman's work and, and yeah. thankless work, which is declining well. Well, it's, it's, Dad, it, it's the, it is the right prescription, Ryan. It just ain't, it's not going to happen. <laughs> They're not going to listen to this is how you handle a decline. Whether it's the SBC or some of the other entities or some of the other denominations, they're going to say either it's not reality or we're going to fight about it. And either one will cause us not to look at the main problem. I don't, I wish people would listen to you, but I don't think they are seeing the trends. Hey, Tom, give me give me one good piece of good news if they always ask me on the way out. Give me a piece of good news. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, you're not going to die tomorrow. Like, I, I don't know what the good news is. But, like, when you look at these denominations, you go, you were 3 million, now you're 1 million. What do you think is going to happen in 10 years? You know, yeah. like, listen, we can never model revival. Okay, I will say that. Like, in this work, there's always a possibility of some spontaneous move of the Holy Spirit. I can't put the Holy Spirit as a variable in my regression model. It, it doesn't work that way. Because it's unpredictable. (laughs) Yeah, pull that quote. Um, But that the reality is, I can only look at the trend lines, and you know what predicts the future? The past, and what you what what your membership has been doing for the last thirty years tells me what it's going to do in the next thirty years. And for almost every denomination in America, it's bad news. (laughs) Well, let me let me conclude with this. Uh, Ryan Burge's multinomial regressions are. A, th- a piece of art. Um, you 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 have to follow his stuff. So, Ryan, thank you for your multinomial regressions. You do them better than anybody else. Um, You're <laughs> Dad, welcome. You're welcome. Those, I don't know. <laughs> this is for stats nerds. You know what I'm talking about. S- statistic joke. Um, Dad, you are the one that identified the inflection point 20 years ago. The peak was 2006. In 2005, you released an article called A Resurgence Not Yet Realized. So you were feeling something 20 years ago, even when things were at their peak, going, okay, I'm not seeing in the data what we would expect to see. And you predicted this inflection point. Now, it has gotten far worse than anyone would have ever known when you were writing. But walk us through with these last few minutes here. What were you thinking in 2005, and what do you think now? Well, Sam, I think it was more than a gut feeling. It was more than intuition. I was following a leading indicator, and the leading indicator was baptisms. The total numbers were not coming down, but baptisms were coming down. And baptisms are more than just a statistical leading indicator. They're also a philosophical and and an, an indicator of what is important to the organization, whether it's the local church or whether it's the denomination. So as I began to see the baptismal rate, it baptisms increased and then they peaked and then the rate began to go down. But even before that, the rate of increase was going down as well. So I did see data. 
I did see that. And that was my leading indicator to say, as the baptisms go, so goes the denomination. And I followed that trend and membership and attendance and everything else followed. So that's a quick answer to what I saw. You know, you know me, Sam. I look, I look at things from a conversionary and evangelistic point of view. And I say, what's happening there? That determines so much about the SBC. Well, thank you both, Ryan Burge, Tom Rayner. Thank Sam you, Rayner. listeners, for to yeah, I'm here too. Um, thank you for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. It, there's not a whole lot of hope here, but I hope that it was helpful um, as we look at a deep dive into the Southern Baptist Convention. The good news is it doesn't have to happen in your church. How about that? The good news is you you can you yourself can buck the trends. Your church can do outreach. Your church can be unified. Your church can say, you know what, we're going to reach the next generation and we're going to do it in a way that isn't caustic and toxic. Um, and I, I would just say, where does, where does all this, where does the solution begin? It begins with you. So if you're of the Southern Baptist tribe, it begins with you. If you're of any other tribe tuning in just because you're curious, it begins with you. Um, and it begins with your church. We certainly want to thank our sponsor again, Tithely. Um, they are serving a lot of churches. They do it well. Um, they do online giving, text giving, but they also manage many other things, volunteer management, check-in, church apps, websites. Um, they're a comprehensive solution. Um, so do us a favor, go, go, go get this free resource. They are providing a free resource to you. Their 2023 state of the church giving report. Uh, the link is in the show notes. It's free. So, um, you might as well take them up on that. And, uh, it's got some really, Hey, this is a data driven show. There's some data in this, uh, resource that, uh, you can go get from Tidely. So thank you, Tidely. Thank you again for everyone tuning in. Rate, review, and subscribe in your podcasting app. Give us a thumbs up, comment on YouTube. Uh, our YouTube audience continues to grow. So if you're tuning in via YouTube, thank you. And we have another Burge Report coming up soon. So stay tuned. Thanks, everyone.